<laughs> that, that, he's running, you see. That's Charlie speaking. <laughs> Steady. Steady. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Open to room. The book of room will be in chapter one. Oh, boy. Root. Root. <coughs> well, this is a romantic one, huh? <laughs> well, it's got some of that in there, yeah. But. That's why you chose it? No, it actually fits within the time period of the judges. So it's kind of like one of the last two books that you look at that kind of fits in with the judges. Technically. So romance isn't on your mind? <laughs> <laughs> Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of the wife was Naomi, and the name of his son, two sons, Mahon and uh, Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Okay, and then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab, the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth, and they dwelled there about ten years. And then and Malon and Chilion, or Chilion, died also, both of them. And the women are, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. And then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. All right. Uh, we can continue there, and then what's going to happen is that she's going to speak to both the daughters-in-law, saying, telling them, "Hey, go, uh, go, go back. You know, I don't have anything for you. And you had ability to be able to have kids. You know, um, if I had them <coughs> like this day, would you wait for them to, be, to grow up to be of age for them to be able to marry you and have, you know, somebody for you to marry?" And uh, Anyways, one of them turns back at the Orpah, and then the other one is Ruth. We see that Ruth's response to her, um, basically to her urging, is that I'm going to stick by you. You know, wherever you go, I'm going to go. You know, where you lay down, I'm going to lay down. And then, uh, you know, your God is going to be my God. You know, your people will be my people. And then they continue on into their journey. They come into Bethlehem. And when the folks <coughs> see her come back, uh, their response is... Um, Well, you skip down to verse 19. Um, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And then Naomi said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call me Naomi, seeing that the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath <coughs> afflicted me? And then, you know, so Ruth and Naomi... Uh, so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite is her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. All right. The indication as far as when this would have fallen uh, in time, uh, we're only told is that it came to pass in the days of the judges, when the judges ruled, and then that it was a time of famine. Um, it's not very specific. So if you were to go through the entire book of Judges, um, there's the first time that you have any specific mention of famine would be when you have uh, Judges 6 about Gideon. So there's conjecture as to whether or not it would have been during Gideon's time. Uh, there's other uh, charts that I'd seen that actually indicate that it would have been between Othniel and Ehud's time as well, even though it's not mentioned specifically about um, there being famine necessarily, but it's uh, as far as all the other conditions and then the, the timeline of when um, from you figure, okay, from when Boaz would have had um, 
his son Obed, and then from there, and then you have the, the, the other genealogies. Uh, but even then, it's not really, it's hard to pinpoint as far as where it specifically would have started. But you know, most of the most of the charts that I'd seen and most of the material that I'd seen as far as consensus seems to fall that it's somewhere between the time of when Othniel and then Ehud, which is still pretty early on in the judge's time frame, uh, that this would have transpired and this would have taken place. And uh, so you figure, okay, what's going on in Israel during that time? If we go back and we remember, okay, even during Othniel and Ehud's time. Okay, this isn't very far removed from when Joshua had already died. And then you have them entering in, into the promised land. And that they're rebuked by the angel of the Lord, being told that, you know, I have given you the land and you haven't taken it. In other words, you have a whole lot of land that's available to you, but you guys aren't really doing much about go ahead and, and taking over as I as I commanded you. Why have you done this? And so they find themselves where, as in the cycle with everybody else, that the bulk of Israel is following idols. They're in idolatry, you know, they turn from God, and that you have um, then the oppression that's going to come as a result, and then the, the, the bad thing that happened to them as a result of the fact that, you know, hey, they're, they're, they're not following God, they're being disobedient to God. We see in Ruth uh, two main protagonists. Um, I wouldn't even call necessarily Ruth because she's kind of like, she's secondary. You see Naomi, well, actually, you really see three. God really is in it throughout all of it. Um, there's, there's three main angles that I was going to look at today. Uh, and we'll see this. First off, it's going to be the goodness of God. Okay, God's goodness. In spite of the fact that um, Naomi, and it's actually under the leadership of her husband, had been uh, disobedient and leaving the land. Um, it starts off with that you have Elimelech, Naomi, and then their two sons leave Bethlehem Judah uh, from Moab because there's a famine in the land. Um, and then they went there originally to sojourn. They eventually remained there. And then what happened was that they died. Um, it doesn't specify still how they died. It just says simply that they died and then so now she's left alone. Um, they, they took too long in their stay there. Um, first off, was that God's will for them to be in Moab? You're saying they should have gone to Moab in the first place? Yes. How do you know that? Um, first off, they <laughs> are to be working their land. They have an allotted land as far as that they're, they're, they're commanded to work. Um, and it's not just specific to that family. In other words, they're Israelites. So um, the famine that's in Israel is as a result of their disobedience to God. Uh, uh, overall, in other words, Israel's condition that they found themselves in was as a result. If we were to go back to Judges, we'd seen that God had promised and said, hey, if you guys follow me, then I will bless you know, I'm going to bless the land, I'm going to bless the work of your hands, but rather if you didn't, then you're going to be oppressed of your neighbors, you're going to be oppressed of those that would be your enemy, and he's also going to cause the land to not produce as much as what it should normally. And so the, the, the famine that was as a result, basic, that, that was there was as a result of their disobedience. If they would have turned to God and they would have trusted God, I know it's kind of, well, it's easy for us to say here, you know, I'm, I'm your quarterback, but if you're in a, when you're in a famine, you're thinking, man, where am I going to get food you know, if the neighboring country has food, then you know why not just go there for a temporary basis and then just, you know. Uh, but it seems like, you know, it went from jo sojourning to just continuing there. And that wasn't God's intended plan. God had called them to there. God had given them a specific plan and a specific plot that he wanted them to work. And ultimately the thing was, is he's supposed to be their provider, which he was, and he was good to them. Uh, go to Psalm 103. Or actually, no, not 103. Um, wow, 
Wow, why did I write this down wrong? I always think of 103. Um, praise you, Lord, for the for the for His wonderful works towards the children of men. Mm. That is 107. 107. I'm sorry. 107. Uh, okay. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good; for His mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Um, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city, did dwell in hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted. Okay, they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses. Um, go down to verse 9. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness. In the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. And here's the reason why they're in that condition. Uh, because they rebelled against the words of the Lord and contempted the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought their heart, uh, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and out of the shadow of death and break their bands and sunder. And then here's the psalmist's admonition is that, oh, that we would praise the Lord for his goodness, for the for his wonderful works to the children of men. Um, he goes to, he goes to uh, give two other examples of people that would have approached God. So that's Israel in, in the, at this time. God's goodness hasn't changed. Okay, now they rebelled and then they found themselves in a position where you're in trouble, but God's goodness hasn't changed. Um, Naomi's response to the affliction and to the, dis the, the discomforting situation and, and uh, the distress that they would have found themselves in was she says, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dwelt bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Okay? And then seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. Okay, you know what that sounds like? Sounds like she's pointing her finger at and saying, it's your fault that I'm in this position. You know, I went out and I was just trying to, you know, make my living. And uh, I was just trying to get by doing the best that I could. And uh, it's your fault, God. You know, you took everything from me. Now, is that true? No. No. Well, God's about to give her something. Yeah. So, Instead of her whiny, piney sons, he's about to give her a good son. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but what's wrong with her perspective? She believes a lie. He's murmuring. Well, yeah, it is murmuring. Yeah, she is believing she's a lie. She's believing a lie, and the, the lie is, assumes that anything that God is using to work His plan in our lives, uh, if it's if it isn't pleasurable or if it's painful, that it's not good. And uh, God's able to work in good and evil. And so her belief that things that are gentle, pleasurable, instead of painful, are uh, evil. She's, it's not true. Well, yes. and, and that she isn't, that you shouldn't be responsible for your, the outcome of the actions you take. I mean, yeah. you, when you go against God, you know, and you have the consequences for that, then those are the consequences for that. Um, Sure. She's avoiding, I mean, her family. And again, to, to put the blame on her is probably not completely accurate because it was her she, husband. She she has, was following. she's following her husband. Yeah. You know, she went home. So that's that would be the area where I would be a little reticent to say, well, Naomi left. Um, no, her husband left. Uh, yeah, she was just following and, her husband. But she went home. So yeah, She has to deal with the effects of that. Yeah. Wrong, even if it wasn't her choice to mm -hmm. do that. So she's a good profile in bitterness, in that it defiles many. Um, also, the fact. But she did have a choice about her attitude. Yeah. Yeah. She didn't have to respond in that manner. She could have acknowledged the fact, hey, look, I was wrong. Well, or. I was thinking about Naomi a while back on just a little study on the. You know, I guess I, I was thinking of a study on just encouraging thoughts for Christians who struggle with seasons where maybe you're not 
really right with God or right relationship with God. And I'd say that's Naomi because there, I believe, is a reason why Ruth said, I'm going to go with you, and your God's going to be my God. I think Naomi did have a testimony uh, for God, and I think that there was a real relationship that she had. There, there's no way in the world that Ruth would know who God was. Maybe, maybe it's partly Ruth's um, husband, but she must have had, <clears throat> she had a testimony that there's a true and living God, and I know Him. And so even though she's going through this time of bitterness, you know, God is still using her testimony. And I, it kind of reminds me of what we saw in Philemon a couple of weeks ago, where we see this guy Philemon who is really a wonderful Christian, a fellow laborer with Paul, and yet there's a little something in his life where he's not as effectual, you know, as he could be. And I would say, I would put Naomi right there in that group, where there's no question that she loves the Lord. There's no doubt, you know, that she means well. But there's a little something. You know, it's sort of like the revelation, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. So. That's a good point. Yeah. It's a great character study for that. That's a good point. Um, <coughs> so we see regarding the uh, situation at hand, she returns. Uh, Ruth joins her. Unfortunately, Orpah doesn't. Um, I personally believe that's an effect of, well, ultimately it's her choice, whether or not she had a good close walk. But the fact was, um, she did push her away. Orpah was willing actually to, it seemed, if we were to read down, uh, they were both crying, they were both hugging, and then she basically yells at them both of them, get away from me, <laughs> go back. But Ruth chooses to say, hey, I'm going to stick by you, and then Orpah just goes back. So there could have been an opportunity there for her to be one. Um, and I don't know necessarily her outcome other than that she returned. She went back to her household. Uh, but she could, she could have been somebody that could have been one and could have been influenced uh, for God. Uh, had she not responded out or lashed out in her, in her hurt and her bitterness. Nevertheless, God was still good to them. They had provision for themselves while they were there. Uh, she was able to make it back to Bethlehem. Uh, if we were to read through... Uh, whenever they return, Ruth is actually going to, this is during harvest time, so then she goes out to work the field. It happens that she follows on Boaz's lot. She doesn't know who Boaz is. Uh, she doesn't know really anybody there. Uh, she's really unfamiliar with Israel altogether, outside of whatever experience she would have had with, obviously, her husband, uh, mother-in-law, father-in-law, and then brother-in-law, exposing her to basically Israeli culture and you know, worship and all. But it, the, the text actually reads that, that she, hap you know, she happened upon uh, Boaz's lot. She works it. Boaz takes notice of her and then commands his servants also to bring her and then also to, to drop handfuls on purpose. So he's, yes? I was going to finish your sentence. Okay, he's going to be giving provision there um, beyond what would, I guess, normally be expected. And that's a, a testimony of the goodness of God. You know, all that men would praise the Lord for his wonderful works towards the children of men. You know, uh, again, it's in, it's in Psalm 107. Uh, you have, whether you're in a down season or you're in an up season, the fact is God's always good. God's been good and he's always going to be good. That's who he is. Uh, you can't deny that. And uh, if you find yourself in a position where you are in sin or experiencing the consequences of your sin, the fact is, if you're not dead, then you're still hoping you can turn to God, you can repent, and you can come back to Him, uh, and then find yourself under His merciful hand. The fact is, He loves to display mercy. You know, that, that's who He is. Sorry, sorry. Oh, I was going to just mention, you mentioned the word hack there. You yes. know, it's sort of a chance word. Uh, sort of like, you know, whatever, but I, I, I can't remember the details of it, but I, I do recall when I studied this in Hebrew in college, that there is, there are some pictures in the word hap, where it's sort of a tongue-in-cheek, kind of like hap and then a wink with it, sort of oh. an idea, where, you know, on the one hand this happened, but... <laughs> 
you know, it, it, it happened at the right time, at the right place, and sort of thing. And the insinuation there is obviously, you know, that God, you know, that it didn't happen to God, you know, with God. In other words, it wasn't just, just random. And it's just real, it's a real neat word in the sense, you know, I think about it in terms of a girl who wants to be appropriate in her relationship with men. And she wants to be modest and have downcast eyes and so forth. But she does happen to be in the place where the guy that she's interested in, you know, might run into her. You know, and they, they have, you know, and there's maybe a little, you know, a guy might think, man, I keep seeing this girl. Like, where is she, how can she, you know, keep showing everywhere I'm at? It seems like we're doing the same stuff and whatever. Well, <laughs> there's a little bit behind the happenings there. And so that's... There's a little bit more. I think the insinuation is more on God's part than on Ruth's part. But uh, Naomi definitely is a romancer, and she, she definitely picked up on the happenings. So <laughs> the, other, the other thing I wanted to look at was from Ruth's angle, and that is that you don't really see very much of her actually responding <coughs> necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, well, pardon you don't see very much of what's going on in her head. It doesn't, all you see is she's brought about, she mentions a few things at the very beginning that uh, <coughs> whenever they're going to go part ways in chapter one. Um, verse 14, <coughs> chapter one, verse 14, it said, they lift up their voice and wept again, and Orba kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her, right? So she's like clinging unto her like glue. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto, thy, unto her people and, and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And then Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. Okay, where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so, mind you, What's the word that she uses there in verse 17? Yahweh. She uses the word, the Lord. She's not just referring to him. She just says, okay, this is God as Elohim before. But rather she's referring to specifically uh, uh, Almighty living God, God of Israel. Okay, so she, she knew God. Uh, uh, do so to me, and more so also if uh, aught but death part thee and me. Okay, and then when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. All right, so then now they go on their way. So this is basically like an insight into her mind. The rest of the book is just kind of she's told to do stuff and she does it. And then she also happens to mention basically responding back to. Uh, Naomi, when Naomi tells her stuff, where you see her actually, you know, speaking the things that were told her uh, to, to, to tell Boaz by Naomi. Okay, so you don't really get a whole lot of insight into her, to her thinking or her personality necessarily outside of, okay, you got that, maybe one other little instance. But by and large, Ruth is just somebody that, okay, she's a Moabitess. So, you guys remember <laughs> who they were, where they came from? Yeah, we saw yeah, they're a mixture of Esau and, and Ishmael. Or they're they're Lot's Lot's daughters, Lot's daughters. obviously. Yeah. But, uh, they, uh, so in other words, they were they were born out of incest, and then they were cousins to Israel. God had specifically mentioned in the law that you know uh, them and Ammon are to be like fought against. In other words, you're not supposed to have hard to turn but beef with them. <laughs> you know, you're not really to go to war with them. Uh, you're, you're not, they're cousins to you, they're related. So in other words, you, you treat them as you would as, you, as you're related to them. Uh, they don't obviously have the privilege that you guys do, but you know, because I'm, I'm your God, but um, they have a little bit of someone more favorite status above the others, I guess you could say. Uh, but nevertheless, they were idolaters. Okay, they weren't believers in Jehovah. They worshiped other gods, uh, and by and large, they were pretty much wicked. But she comes to know God, okay? And 
Uh, she's obviously of quality, character, and integrity, so much so that Boaz takes notice of her, and it's she has a reputation amongst uh, the folks that among, you know whom she works there in Israel. Uh, so much so that, that he, you know, not only does he take notice of her because he's watched her, but also just because her reputation. Yes. I think he was more attracted to her because of the fact his mother was foreign. Could, well, that could be. I don't know. And that's probably why he got the farm, everything, be, or, or the yeah, the farm or whatever, because of the fact she was allowed to bring whatever she wanted um, with her, which could have been the family jewels, whatever. And he saw. I mean. He was born there in Israel, but he was influenced by his mother because she had trusted in Jehovah. And that's probably what attracted him to Ruth. That could be the case. I don't know. I know, I could certainly see where it would be something that he would take notice and be like, well, I, I can relate. In other words, I'm a romanticist. Okay. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, her, her situation. You know, you're a foreigner here <clears throat> coming in to trust God, and then that would be difficult as far as that there's, there's But the thing is, there's two angles on that. On the one hand, some men want to marry men like their, or not marry men, want to marry a woman like their mother. So on the other hand, some men don't want to marry anything like their mother. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the unsaid, the untold, is just something we don't know. So it's possible he liked his mom. You know, but Ruth was her own person. You know, definitely was, he definitely was attracted to her. I mean, he, he stated in, he stated that one of the things that he liked about her was that she wasn't following um, the young men or rich. She wasn't out chasing guys. And uh, there's, there is that attractiveness in a woman a man wants to marry where he knows she doesn't have eyes for as Hank Williams says window shopping <laughs> <coughs> you're only window shopping you're not buying you're just looking for the best deal in town <laughs> my, my, my point with focusing on her was <coughs> You have the no, no, that's fine. It's the the fact that outside of outside of the fact that you have the few instances where she gives an actual response to flyers, like, well, this is what I'm thinking. One of which would have been when she talked to Ruth. The other one would have been down in verse 10, chapter 2, that she fell on her face and found herself the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? And, uh, thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger. Outside of that, um, every other instance where you see her interact is basically responding to something that she's asked, or she actually goes ahead and when she uh, speaks to Boaz on the threshing floor, um, was her obeying what Naomi had told her to do. Okay, so um, as somebody that is a Moabitess, okay, so she's a stranger, she doesn't could say she doesn't belong necessarily, but she's come to trust under uh, the living God. Okay, so she's come to know God, and then she would be somebody that you would figure would be very unlikely to be in the lineage of Messiah. But we know that to be later down the road that that's who God had, cho who God had chosen uh, to work through, as far as uh, through Boaz's lineage, and then you know she could be somebody that's going to birth Obed, and then Obed eventually Jesse, and then Jesse David. Um, she was just somebody that was simply open to instruction and was obedient to what she was told to do. Go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, the superfluity of naughtiness, and receive the meekness 
with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Uh, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Okay? So in other words, when you actually carry out what you've learned, what you've assimilated as far as knowledge is concerned, when you actually act on it, that's you're, you're blessed. No, the blessing comes in actually following through and living out the Word of God. Okay, um, there's, there's two parts. If you're ignorant, you have to come to a point of knowledge. So in other words, you have to inform yourself of what is right to do. But and then the second part is the expectation that you're actually supposed to act on it. And that's the whole point of being informed, is so that you would act on what what you what's what's supposed to be done as far as right is concerned. And that we see Naomi is a perfect example of, or excuse me, not Naomi Ruth is a perfect example of. Uh, we don't see, uh, you know, again, not very much of her. We do know her background, and we see her mentality to some degree expressed. She recognizes, okay, she's a stranger. She recognizes, hey, you know, this is uh, a little different or exceptional here that. You would have such kindness to me, uh, especially somebody that you know. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm foreigner here in Israel, uh, but I know God, and you know, I want to follow Naomi's God. I want to follow the God of Israel, uh, under whom she's come to trust, and that God had just blessed her. And so, her finding her man <laughs> came as a result of basically, and that wasn't even her prompting. It was actually Naomi's prompting when we look at the situation. Uh, she had come home from threshing, and then Naomi says to her, you know, how long are you going to look like this, basically? In other words, you know, I'd like for you to find rest. And here, she was the one that had gone and done the, the investigating with regard to Boaz. Uh, and she was the one that told Naomi, hey, look, listen, when you approach him, here's what you're going to do, here's what you're going to say, here's how you do this, and such. And so, God blessed. And mind you, it wasn't, again, because of any pedigree, or anything, it was simply an integrity and character thing. Uh, she had a hard attitude that said, yes, Lord, and was open to instruction. And then when she was told to do something, you don't see really any questioning. And so she went ahead and she followed through and she did it. She did okay. get an upgraded pedigree too. <laughs> Better bloodlines. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so God blessed her she was blessed in her deed because she was just simply obedient to what she needed to do was right. Okay, and so we likewise, uh, if we seek not just to know things, but actually act on that which we know to be right. When we seek to, to know right and then actually act on it, we'll be blessed in our deed as well. Uh, and then the final thing, uh, well, the final thing I was going to look at was as Boaz as kinsman redeemer. But I'll be honest with you, <laughs> these type things are kind of hard for me. My mind doesn't work along those lines. I can see the literal and I can see the things. It's just those, when it comes to types, um, as Boaz being a type of Christ, unless it's something that's explicitly stated when you have like in Galatians where it talks about uh, Abram and Sarah and then Hagar. Or um, yeah, he as well. Um, then I, then it becomes like it's just you're, you're, you're pulling stuff out of the air, making fantasy and inventing stuff. So that's, um, but Boaz is. Um, so what you're saying is, is all the people that make a lot out of the typology, if it's not expressly mentioned in the New Testament as a type, then that's just false teaching. That's the way you feel about it. It's hard to. Yeah, personally. Okay. That's all I mean. <laughs> I'm not saying. I'm not saying that there isn't valid points that could be thrown so out. preaching isn't really preaching. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it okay. just kind of like it sounds cool, but I my because then you end up having to try and look at stuff that's meant literally in a figurative sense, and then you just try and it, it feels like feel good stuff, like you're just sitting around in a room, you know making up stuff to try to make, yourself, make each other feel good. 
and then missing the whole point of what's actually really there and what's meant to be communicated. Thanks. Which was uh, God's good, good and that. regardless of the fact that you find yourself in a position that you put yourself in because of sin, God's still going to be good. And if you return to Him, then you know you can experience His grace <coughs> abundantly in your life. Two, uh, don't let bitterness defile you. You find yourself in a position of bitterness, obviously you would repent. Because uh, bitter, bitterness uh, not only you know harms you, but it also harms others. It affects others negatively. And three, if we would um, seek to be obedient to that which we know, to that which we learn, then we'll be blessed in our deed. Um, does anybody have any questions? Wow, okay. All right. Next week we're going to be looking at the beginning part of Samuel, and that's going to end our whole Judges series. Yes? I don't really have a question about it, but I just love the ending of Ruth where, it, where the you know the women came to Naomi and said, you're blessed because you have a daughter-in-law that's better to you, better than seven sons. Yeah. And you think of the culture of the day, certainly the value on children, children on, on the firstborn son and then on sons and really the way that women were devalued. And it's, there's a really beautiful reminder in Ruth that God's never thought that way. God's never been, you know, the culture of the day may be that women are less than men and a son is what's important, but a daughter is not as important. There are cultures like that today, even. <clears throat> China like that. China would really come to mind right away. India. And yet right in God's inspired word is this beautiful picture of two women that changed the outcome of the bloodline of Jesus Christ because of their faithfulness to God. And, you know, I, you, it's just popular for people that hate God to say, you know, the Bible, you know, God hates women and that's why people like religion is because of the ability to, you know, have a patriarch and to put women in this place and this sort of thing. Well, that may be the way mankind is. And there may be women that fall into that type or are attracted to that type of culture. You know, you always ask the question, why do these women run away and go join ISIS to be a slave? And of course they, they they're naive. They think, you know, they want to be part of something. Well, they like that culture. I mean that's what they, they like. So it's not just men that would be into the mistreatment of women. Uh, but God's not like that. And here's a just a beautiful illustration in his word in, in his word where there's a man who you know this this guy you know that Ruth marries is just a good guy you know he doesn't have any kind of prejudice he's careful about not allowing her name to be besmirched about per, the protection that a woman ought to have but he likes her you know and he treats her as his equal she's not a She's not an underling. And then everybody, because of their example, looks at them and says to Naomi, if you had seven sons, they wouldn't be as good as that daughter mom you've got. I'd rather have her than all, you know, than all the sons. And that's really, it's just, it's really neat. Uh, it's, I just love it that God's Word is so explicit about what marriage is and relationships are. And it records what people do that isn't right. But then it also records what is right. Yes. A little different kind of comment, but Solomon loved Rahab, and then Boaz loved Ruth. The trait of loving, of loving foreign women stopped right there until it hit Solomon, and that's where the problem started. Because he was king, he could have anybody he wanted. That's an interesting concept. It, it was like a trait, and then it stopped until it got to Solomon, because God warned him at least once or twice about having foreign women, Well, because he knew it was going to be a problem with him. The difference was that these women worshipped God. Solomon's right. women 
did not. Taught yes. his wife to worship. So I don't think it has anything to do with being foreign born because anyone could be a proselyte of Israel. But it did have a lot to do with. Yeah, was whether they were um, believers. Th th those two were. Yes. They were. They were believing. <laughs> Actually, Rahab. <laughs> Rahab. Um, yeah, I'll just mention this. Okay. Rah Rahab in particular, just uh, she had trusted uh, at, at the expense, basically, of almost losing her life. In other words, she, she at, at risk of her own life and her family's life uh, to, to let the spies, you know, let spies go and then, you know, tell them. Uh, her, 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 her people basically, hey, look, these guys didn't come through here. They went this other way. Uh, it was like, uh, no other questions were dismissed. Sorry, Tom. No, the